Welcome back. So last time we introduced the concept of forces and we said that a force is related to a change in momentum but we were very careful to say that only if I have a net force will I get a change in momentum and that's the essence of Newton's second law. If I have a force, a net force, then I have a change of momentum. If I have a change of momentum then there must be a net force. That doesn't mean that just because there's no net force doesn't mean there's no forces at all. So say we've got these two things that are pushing directly against each other. Well, if their forces cancel out, well, obviously their momentum isn't going to change. And so there's no net force. And that's something that you really need to keep in mind to keep kind of separate in your brain. Now, we've talked about how work is related to energy. Work causes, for example, a change in energy. It's defined to be a change in energy. So we've also defined force to be due to a change in momentum. Well, we know that energy and momentum, particularly kinetic energy, are related to each other. So it is logical to assume then that force and work are also going to be related to each other. And that's what we're going to take a look at in the, today's lecture. Let's get started. So up to this point, we've used a lot of different techniques to figure out what particular equations are. I've almost never just given you an equation that here, memorize this. Because in the real world, especially if you're looking for something that's never been known before, something that's yet to be discovered, you've got to find some way that you can figure out and tease out of the data where that actually is. So we're gonna learn another technique today. So take a look at Microsoft Microtask 1. We want to find a way that we can find a relationship between the energy and the work. So the first thing we're gonna do then is we're gonna write down what are the fundamental units of work. Well, remember, work is an energy. We know it's joules, but we need to have the fundamental units. That means kilograms, meters, and seconds. So pause the video, work out the SI, the fundamental units from the SI units for work and also do the same thing for force. Pause the video and do that now. All right, you got it? Okay, so work then is an energy and we decided that that was going to be a kilogram meter per second or meter squared per second squared, right? And if you don't remember how we got that, there's a couple of ways we could do this. Remember, we could take one half mv squared, and so that would be a kilogram, and then a v squared is a meter squared over second squared. Another thing you might have done was do mgh. Well, then that's going to be a kilogram times a meter per second squared times a meter. Either way, you're going to end up with the same thing. So that's our unit of energy, so that's also our unit of work, because work is just another type of energy when it comes down to it. All right, so now for force, we define that to be a newton. And so we need something that's going to tell us what those units are. And if you remember when we did this last time, we said that one of the things we could start with would be Newton's second law. I'm going to go ahead and do it in instantaneous terms. So the units of momentum then, let's go ahead and expand that out so that everybody knows where that comes from. That's going to be mass times velocity there. So I've got a kilogram from the mass. I've got a meters per second from the velocity and then another second coming in from this time that I have down here. So the total units then are going to be kilogram meters per second squared. So we'll write that here. That's going to be kilogram meters per second squared. All right, so now here's what's new. In order to find the relationship between the work and the force, all we need to do is figure out what quantity is missing from this. And the easy way to do that is to just divide them. So I'm going to take kilogram meters per second, and then I'm going to, per second squared, sorry, and then I'm going to divide that by kilogram meters per second squared. Okay, well remember, we flip and multiply our fractions. So this is the same thing as kilogram meters squared per second squared times seconds squared over kilogram meters. So I just flip that fraction and multiply it. Well, you see my kilograms cancel, my second squareds cancel, and one of my meters cancel. So this is the new technique. The relationship between these two, you, the, between these two physical quantities, the work and the force, must be related to something that has units of, of meters, something that has units of length. Well, okay, what quantity has that? Well, obviously, it's a distance of some kind. And there's a couple ways. If we're talking about vectors, then we're really looking at a displacement. Are we talking about a vector though? So let's let's see if that makes sense, right? This is going to be a change in my distance. 
And so somehow, if I'm going to have a force times this change in distance, right, I need to get something that is not a vector. I need to get a scalar from that. If I had a force and I just multiplied it times the distance, so not a vector, that won't work because I've got a vector on this side and a scalar on this side, and that, that is verboten. That's forbidden. We can't do that. So instead, what I need to do is I need to take the dot product of the force and this displacement. Now they're both vectors. And just to remind you about the dot product, it's also called the scalar product. So vector A, big fat, dotted into vector B, is equal to AB cosine theta. So in this case, then, if I dot F, the force, into delta X, then that's just going to be F delta X times that angle between them. Okay. So if these are in the same direction, so let's suppose that I'm only working in one dimension. So here's my robot, for example, and I apply this force in this direction, and the robot moves this delta X. What is the angle between this force and this displacement? Well, they're in the same direction, right? So it's zero. Cosine of zero is one. So for this one case where I'm in one dimension, so which is what we've been talking about this whole semester, we'll add two dimensions later, then I can say that F dotted into delta X must equal just their magnitudes together. And I need to have a magnitude in order to get this. So this says that work, remember what we were working for, work is going to be my force times the magnitude of the displacement, the distance that I've traveled here. Okay. So that is my expression for work in terms of force. So this tells me the relationship between the work and the force. You simply multiply by the distance. All right, now remember, anytime we're doing this kind of dimensional analysis, there's one thing that dimension analysis can't give you, and that's this constant. There is always a constant of proportionality there. And the only way we can get that is either through some sort of theory, theoretical derivation, you know, looking at kinematics or, or calculus or something like that, or we can do experiments. In either case, in, the, in this case, you're going to find that C equals 1. So since C equals 1, there's no point in writing it. And so we will go ahead and define this then to be our, our definition of work. So our definition of work in terms of forces, right? So force is just going to be F times delta X. All right, take a look at that. So now look at microtest two. Is it possible to apply a force to an object and not do any work? What would be the condition for that? And then come up with a physical situation when that would actually occur. Pause the video and really think about this. Have you got one? Okay, well, mathematically, we know that since F is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, if our work, we want, we want to do the work in terms here, if our work then is equal to F times delta X, and neither, none of these are vectors because the work is a scalar. If F is not zero, so it's saying a force is being applied, yet the work is zero, what must the displacement be? The displacement must be zero in that case. So the only way that I can get a work being zero, no work being done, while I have a net force being applied, remember this is the net force, then the only way that can happen is if I have a displacement of zero. So that tells you something. That tells you that unless that object is moving as a result of that force, no work was done. And that's pretty. That's going to be true for just about all the cases that you could possibly think of. So can we think of a case where I am trying to apply a force, but I'm not getting any work done? Well, probably one of the most common ones is to think about a wall here, and we talked about this last time. If I'm leaning against that wall, I'm pushing against that wall, I'm applying a force here, right? So this is a force from Dr. K. And as we talked about last time, that means the wall is also applying a force in the opposite direction because the momentum isn't changing. The wall isn't moving. I'm not that strong. So my net force here is zero, sure. But I am applying a force, but this wall is not moving in this case. Since it's not moving, then that tells me that no work is done. So you can push as hard as you want. You can feel like you're really, really, really working hard, 
you haven't done any work in the sense of engineering and physics because you didn't make that wall move. Okay, so let's take a more practical approach then. Let's look at an actual problem here in Microtest 3. So here we've got a robot spring cannon that is storing 0.5 joules of energy. So we know that our stored energy in our spring is 0 0.05. So I'll put my zero in front of that just so we don't get confused. So that's 0 0.5 joules. That's how much is stored in the spring. We're told the robot mass. I have to think about it. Does the robot mass matter? We're launching that spring cannon. So here's my picture. And here's my spring cannon, we'll say. And then I'm taking this projectile and I'm launching it this way. Right? And the mass of that projectile, it says, is 0 0.050 kilograms. We'll call that MP. And then we'll write it down for a reference here. The robot mass is 0 0.43 kilograms all right so the spring is exerting a force of 20 newtons so here's my spring right and it's pushing it out and so the force of the spring then we've decided is 20 newtons and remember a newton 20.0 if we want to make sure we keep all of our significant digits remember that a newton is the si unit of force it's like a weight it's how much force is being applied okay we want to know what distance over what distance does this spring have to keep touching the, the projectile in order to give it that amount of force, right? So what is so we want to work out what that displacement of that spring has to be. So pause the video, see if you can work that out. Start, it could be a hint. Start with our definition of work in terms of our definition of force times delta x. And then also remember your conservation of energy. Pause the video. Do that now. You got it? Okay, let's see how we can set that up. So we know that all of the stored energy of the spring is going into work, right? That's going into the work done by the spring. So maybe we'll just call that WS. And we know that the work is by definition the force of the spring times that displacement. So the amount of work done depends not only upon the force provided by the spring, but also by the displacement. Now I'm going to pause here just a second. We are going to assume that the force provided by that spring is constant over that entire displacement. It's not true. We'll fix that later on and when we start talking about that in more detail. But for now, we're just going to assume that it doesn't change by much. That So we can talk about kind of an average force that's being expended there. Okay. so. Since these two things are equal, then I know that my spring energy is going entirely into the work. And so if I want to find my displacement, US over FS then is simply going to be equal to the displacement. And if you work that out, we get 0 0.50 joules divided by 20.0 newtons. And that's going to be 0 0.025 meters, about two and a half centimeters from there. Does that make sense? So I must compress this by two and a half centimeters in order to get that much work out of it. So that's my displacement that I'm using to accelerate that projectile to launch out of it. I have to touch it for that amount of time in order to convey that much energy. I've got that much energy stored. If I want all of that energy to go into the projectile, then it must remain in contact with, this, with the projectile for at least two and a half centimeters. What if it doesn't? What if it only stays in contact with it for one and a half centimeters? Well, then what's going to happen is if I'm not going to release all of that energy that's stored in the spring. So some of that energy is still going to be in there. Not all of the stored spring energy is going to go into the work. And so my projectile is going to be going with a slower velocity because it's got less kinetic energy from that. Okay, so suppose we want to know how much time is required to fire this projectile. All right, so the same situation, but we want to know how much time is required. Well, okay, I can't use energy method if I'm wanting to get the time. So what I want you to do is pause the video. Again, we're going to assume that the force is const that the force is constant while the spring is in contact with it. It's not true, but it's close enough for us. We're also going to assume that the mass is constant. And that's a pretty reasonable assumption, right? We don't expect any mass to go flying off of our projectile or anything like that. So pause the video, go on to the next page, take this data, and see if you can figure out a mathematical expression that will allow you to determine the time in which 
that must be in contact. Do that now. You got it back? Did you really work it out? You need to work this out. It's, it's actually very critically important that you do. Okay, so let's take the material that we did last time from the last problem, take all that initial data, and let's see if we can figure out how to find the time to launch the projectile. Okay, and we'll use the same diagram that we used before where we've got our cannon here and that pushes out here and then my projectile ends up going here with some velocity of the projectile. We know the mass of the projectile and we know that we were given the mass of the robot. We know what that is, of course. And we know how much spring energy is stored in here. And finally, we know our force, which is going to be acting in this direction. We'll make this be our positive direction. And this is going to be our delta x. So let's record those symbols down here when we get, well, before we get started on our step two. So we know that the spring potential energy is going to be 0 0.50 joules. We know that the force of the spring is going to be positive. 20.0 newtons because it's acting in the positive direction. Okay. So we also know that our initial velocity of our projectile, what is the initial velocity of the projectile? Well, it's at rest, right? So that's zero meters per second. We know the mass of the projectile, and that's 0 0.050 kilograms. We know the mass of the robot, which is 0 0.43 kilograms. And what I want to know is T in seconds. All right. So we're going to start with something that's going to give that to us. And so you need something with time. Well, we've said that the force is constant. And one of the equations we know, if the force is constant and if the mass is constant, and it certainly is, then we can use this F equals ma. So if we assume that nothing's flying off of that projectile, then we can use that. But remember, it's a special case. So if the force is constant, what does that tell you about the acceleration since the mass isn't changing? The acceleration is also constant. So anytime you have a constant acceleration, what is your brain screen? Kinematics. So we're going to write down a kinematics equation. Well, I need a kinematics equation that uses just the stuff that I have. Do I know this VP? Do I know this final velocity of the projectile? No, I don't. Now, I can use kinematics to find it if I know everything else. But what I do know is this distance, or if I can find it, then I'll be in good shape. So let's start with the distance versus time. So that's going to be xi plus vit plus one half a t squared. So now the only thing that I need is to get this, this displacement. Well, we did that last time, but we'll go ahead and put that here. We know that us is equal to the work, which is equal to f delta x. So that's the same thing as saying us is equal to f delta x. All right, we've got one, two, three equations. My unknowns then, I'm going to need my acceleration. I don't know what that is. And I'm going to need my displacement. I don't know what that is. So three equations, three unknowns. Now you may say, well, what about work? That's another symbol. Sure, that's true. And if you want to use that as a symbol, then your equation is simply that us equals w. And that's all. All right, so let's start with kinematics. So we always start with what we want. So that's xf minus xi plus vi t plus one half a t squared. This is zero, fortunately, so we don't have to use a quadratic equation on that, quadratic formula. I'm going to move this xi to the other side, and so I get xf minus xi is equal to one half a t squared. But this is just the displacement. So that's displacement is one half a t squared. Okay, so let's solve this for t squared. And so then I'm going to have that t squared is going to equal delta x, our displacement, times 2, and then divided by that acceleration. You see I've got a vector divided by a vector, so that's going to cancel out the vector nature of it. I'm going to be left with the scalar as I should. All right, so I have used this equation. It's done. I need to come up with some way of getting this delta x. Well, that's going to be this equation. And this is the same thing that we did in the previous part. We said that us is equal to f delta x. Same thing we did on the, pre on the previous page. And so when I did that then, I want to solve for delta x. So us over f is equal to delta x. So 
we can, the only thing we need here then is if we could find the force, then we'd be in good shape, right? The other thing we might do is we need that acceleration. Well, we already have an idea of what equation we're going to use for that. So why don't we put that in there? And I know that this is going to be two times us over f times a. So now all I need to do is find something for a. And of course, those are actually going to be dotted together so that I only have my, my scalar component from that. So let's start with f equals ma. Solve it for a, simple as that, because I know f, right? I don't want to solve for f because I already know that. That's a number. And that tells me that a is equal to f divided by the mass. So let's plug that in here. And so I get t squared. Let's get rid of that little funky thing right there. So I get that t squared, being very careful to copy this down, is ug f times f over m. So when I flip this and multiply, I get 2ugm over f squared. Now I'm going to take the square root of both sides. And if you're OK with that, I'm just going to do that this way to save some space. And now we're ready to plug in and get our final answer. So when I did this, I got that t was equal to 2 times the energy stored in my projectile, in my spring, which is 0.05, I'm sorry, 0.50 joules. 0.50 joules times the mass of my projectile. This is MP, right? And so the mass of my projectile was 0.050 kilograms divided by 20.0 newtons, whole thing squared. All right, so let's pull out our calculators and let's see what we get from that. And don't forget, by the way, to take the square root. Yes, very important. All right, so we have 2 times 0.5 times 0.05. And then, whoops, lost it, 2 times 0.5 times 0.05, and then divide by 20 squared, and then finally take the square root, and I get that the time is 0.0112 seconds, or about roughly 11 milliseconds or so. And that makes sense, right? That spring is going to fire very, very quickly, but now we can get it using this method. Now, there are some other effects that we've ignored, for example. So, for example, we've ignored the friction in the cannon, right? We've also ignored that the spring is, could be heating. If you take a spring, take a piece of metal and stretch, 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 it's going to get hotter, right? Um, we've ignored air resistance. And we've also ignored the fact that we actually have a non-constant force from that spring. We mentioned that it's not constant, but we assumed that it was. So a lot of times I can't actually solve for all this. Air resistance, for example, is well beyond the level that we're at right now. However, by looking at the forces, I can determine how that's going to change that 20 newtons that we get, right? Because they're vectors. So my force of friction, if my main force, my main spring force is this way, my force of friction is going to be a little bit this way. Heating is going to take out some energy, so that's going to take out that work. So we add that in a conservation of energy. Air resistance, so this might be the force of friction. Air resistance is also going to be in that same direction. So that could be my force due to the air resistance. And then there's the fact that this is a non-constant F. And that we can only recognize by saying, I can't actually use this, can I? Because that F is going to be changing in time, and so I no longer have a constant acceleration. But that's OK. So read some of the rest of this. What we're talking about here is first order effects. And first order effects are by definition the thing that is most affecting your problem. And you always, as an engineer, you start out by saying, what are the things that are most affecting my situation? Those are those first order effects. Once you work that out, now you can start adding in these smaller pieces. And sometimes you're going to have to go to a computer to do that for you. But the results that you get out of the computer should still follow your first order results. They should be just small variations from your first order results. So it's really important that you know how to do this so that you can interpret what the computer is doing for you later. So now that we've worked on forces and we've seen that there are a relationship between work, energy, and forces, we've got a whole lot more tools in our toolbox, a bunch of different ways we can approach the same problem.
So never get stuck into just one. Always think about what's going to be the easiest way to go. Now that we've learned about forces and we've got that transition to them, I'm going to show you over the next several weeks how we can apply those to a lot of the same situations that we used when we were talking about energy. The other thing that forces are going to do for us is it's going to allow us to branch out into multiple dimensions. So here very soon we're going to start talking about two-dimensional forces, so where we're maybe shooting something up and out at the same time. None of this is going to be new. It's all just going to be an extension of what you've already learned. So if we can master these topics here, you're going to be good to go. We'll see you next time.